as though by magic and by your own making, you find yourself walking down a long labyrinthine passageway, following the voice. It's echoing louder and louder around the stone walls. And gradually, eventually, the tunnel opens out into what feels like it must be the very centre of the cave and the centre of gravity itself. In the middle is a round, low stone wall. It's got bottles stacked all around the edges, different sizes, and all, it seems, with clear liquid inside them. You look over the edge into the centre of the bottles and it's filled with silvery light. It's filled with water. Suddenly you notice a pair of piercing blue eyes staring at you from around two of the bottles and quickly look away. Dama, Lars. This is Lars and I'm going to tell you her story. Deg oid fanon vair penllyn. She had found it in the well at the bottom of the cliffs, bobbing gently amongst delicate fronds of gutweed, the tiniest trickle of fresh water playing upon its glass. Through the sayad and sound, the moon had been full and the tide was coming in so that the first splashes of seawater were starting to make it up into the small pool in the rocks. It was like a cauldron of potion, last thought, the way the two waters bubbled and mixed together. And there, like an offering, for her, surely. Potel Gwydrbach, a small glass bottle. It was only a metre or so away. She could have got there in one stride, but when she'd rolled up the ends of her trousers and stepped into the cool water, the sand was so silky, the seaweed so soft, that she took her time, the anticipation building. And when she picked up that small glass bottle. She saw that there was a scroll of paper inside. Dimond in geir at a papir, she know. Just one word. Grandauch. Listen. And this became Lars's life's mission. Abristwyth, Lleiar Blawn. Mae las wedi newid lot ar sfanon fair. Mae ei theulu wedi prynu bwthyn bach i lawr yr arddordia yng Nghanol Cymru. Mae hi wedi dechrau ei mislif ac yn sydyn angen mwy o le. Yn bendant, mae ei hantur yn tyfu. Las had changed a lot since sfanon fair, St Mary's Well. Her family had moved down the coast to a little cottage near the sea. Of course they would be by the sea. Her father was a fisherman and Lars was glad. She knew nothing else. She was entering that time though, that special time of womanhood and, well, she needed more space, frankly, and took to adventuring more and more, filling her rucksack with a flask of tea, sandwiches and her journal and pens, going out every day, all day if she could, or after school if she couldn't. Well, on this day, she went the furthest south she'd been yet and came to a long sandy beach, walked right to the end of it, she did, and there was a hut there, a little wooden hut with, well, it was on stilts and there was a little ladder going up to the top platform. Lars had heard about these. Her granny had told her about a weird and wonderful woman called Shani, who'd kept chickens in one on a beach further down south called Kebach. 
Maybe her granny had even known her. Well, as Lars walked up that ladder, she saw that plainly no one had been there for ages. This was her hut now. And Lars was savvy with the tide table. She knew that the high tide had just been and, and the water hadn't come up to the platform. It was safe. She went home immediately, grabbing blankets, finding a musty old cushion, and packed her bag again. A bigger flask of tea, lots more snacks, and her most prized possession, a potel Gwiderbach. She walked quickly back to the hut, dumping her things on the platform, putting the musty pillow up one end and the blankets into a makeshift bed, and then she took out that note and she pinned it with a Kirby grip in between two of the wooden slats at the foot of her bed. Grandeuch, it said, and listen she would. At dusk, Lars tucked herself in and listened to the soothing sounds of the sea, letting them sing her to sleep. But it was full moon that night, again, as the moon rose high enough to shine its bright light in through the open front of her hut, Lars began to have the vividest, most crazy dream she'd ever had in her life. And then she awoke. She couldn't remember the dreams, but she felt still in that trance-like, dream-like state. And she found herself walking barefoot down the ladder onto the sand, pulling a blanket behind her and zigzagging slowly towards the way. As she walked, she listened to the sounds of the sea. She'd never noticed in all her years out on the fishing boat with her dad how many voices there were in the water. The hush of tiny pebbles as the waves sucked them back in, the splashes on the surface and everything in between. And when last got to the point where sand met water, she heard the sounds kind of merging into a new frequency. It was a high-pitched fizzing sort of sound, a, a silver gold sound, a bit like a cross between bees, a swarm of bees, yes, and starlight. And as Lars fell deeply into this sound, it seemed to turn into a human tone, a pure, genderless tone. And this became a melody that took her on a journey, a fluid journey of sound. And then suddenly, the sea was singing words to her, a song. She hadn't even noticed that she had it with her, but last found herself stooping down to the waves, still listening to their song and filling the bottle with water and corking it again and walking back up the sand, up the little ladder, and into bed. When she awoke, the sea was licking the top rung of her ladder. She couldn't go anywhere. But Lars was not afraid. She was excited. And she found the little bottle, a pot alquadurbach, from amongst her blankets, and <gasps> there was really water in it. Had she honestly caught a song? There was only one way to find out. And that high-pitched fizzing, silver-gold sound, like a cross between a swarm of bees and starlight, came spilling out. And then that pure tone, and then the melody, and then the words, more than she'd remembered hearing last night. And in the hours it took for the sea to descend back down the sand, Lars learnt that song off by heart. Then she went skipping back all along the beach, through the town, to her parents' cottage. She was glad to get back to a bit of normality and even to school for a little while. And it wasn't for another moon month that Lars returned to her hut. This time she took an even bigger flask, one of those huge Stanley ones, and lots more sandwiches. And, well, Lars had a plan. Bronen in deg petwaroid, kaskli caneon, a traith, cynllunio. My lass and dord and all, now mis, and gobeithio i glywed fwy o geneon. 
Cafodd hi syniad i gasglu poteli gwag ar y traeth. When she got back to the hut, she dumped her rucksack on the platform and then she went out. Litter picking, if you like. She went collecting empty glass bottles from the beach. It was a huge beach and she found many bottles left by fire makers, by drinkers. Lots of people like to have driftwood fires in this area and well, there was a whole selection. There were even some that looked like they'd been swimming in the sea for a while, worn down glass, all kinds of bottles. And Lars rinsed each one out in seawater and then stacked them neatly around the edges of the platform. At dusk, when the moon began to rise, Lars didn't bother getting into bed. She, she wasn't interested in sleep, quite frankly. She was too excited for that right now. And she took her favourite bottle, a rose lemonade bottle. She looked at the moon and, well, it wasn't quite full, but she was sure this would not matter. And she went barefoot onto the sand with her bottle, zigzagging, tracing her steps she'd remembered making last time all the way down to the sea's edge. And there she listened. And there were different sounds this time, different layers, different voices. Lars listened, and listened some more. And suddenly, like last time, all of the sounds of the sea seemed to merge, seemed to shift into a different frequency. And this time, it was a shimmering emerald tone like the green and the rainbow of a salmon's skin. Lars listened some more, and then a new ditty, a new tune, and different words. To bring the magic thing to me from plots lost out to sea. She stooped like last time, filled that rose lemonade bottle with water. Well, half filled it because a wave came over her knee and got her soggy. And then, walking up the beach, she found a little bit of driftwood, the perfect size to jam into the top to stop the water spilling. And then up the little ladder, she stepped and into bed where she slept soundly. The sea was nowhere near her hut when she awoke the next morning. But Lars wasn't going anywhere. She had her work cut out. She listened to that song. The magic had worked. She learned it off by heart. And when she had done so, she walked home, a spring in her step. And so it was that Lars became Wales's most unusual song collector. De chwelodd hi'r cwt bob mis tan ddiwedd y flwyddyn, Ac ar y diwedd, roedd ganddi 13 o ganeon, digon ar gyfer albwm. She returned every moon month, and each month the sea gave her a new song. They were quite different really, some very melancholic, some more upbeat. The occasional strange one, once there was even what sounded like a kind of aquatic pop song. And, well, by the end of the year, gan diwedd y flwyddyn. Lars had 13 songs, enough for an album. But her work didn't stop there. A few years later, when she left school, Lars decided this would be her life's work, and she took to a more nomadic lifestyle. She walked the whole of the coast of Wales, following each and every river, seeking out the sacred wells and springs, and everywhere she went, the water gave her songs. She still didn't know who or what exactly was singing them to her. Aspridamor, the spirit of the sea themselves. But Lars did not care. She just felt that she had to keep collecting these songs. And over time, of course, her collection grew big and heavy and she upgraded her rucksacks, getting bigger ones each time. And then she was on to suitcases and hauling them round. And well, Lars had to find places to sleep. She slept wherever she could, in hedges, in huts, in bothies and the hillsides, even on the occasional park bench or in a bus stop once or twice. 
Sometimes the odd person let her into their hearts. But her favourite places were caves. They made great storage facilities for her bottles and she didn't want to leave any of them behind. But one by one, the caves became inaccessible. The sea level was rising. Decades went by until eventually last came to this one. And it's just as well she found it, just as well we found it, for this is the last cave, Rokov Olaf. And here, Lars has set herself the task of inscribing each and every song from the bottles onto these stone walls. You watch her now, moving between the well, where she arranges her bottles and chooses the next one to write down, going back to the walls, and you hear her scribbling and scraping away. And then you hear her voice, her voice. There are different ways to remember, but the best one is listening. She returns to the well and looks you in the eyes with her piercing blue ones. And this time, she does not look away. <laughs> Forevermore.